Okay, we are looking today at Open Fellowship error still, and uh, we look today at another aspect of what happened in the Old Testament with the children of Israel as they left Egypt and headed towards the Promised Land. In this case, we're looking at do not fear. The Bible tells us do not fear. It told them do not fear. All of the appeals that we have talked about to this point about reality are really nothing but an excuse. Every time you point at, well, just look around. Nobody has done this. Nobody's believed this. Or, you know, if it, you know, if it can be done, why isn't it being done? Uh, all of those are just excuses. And when it comes to the open fellowship error, and we're not talking about, you know, outside the churches, we're talking about brethren, this appeal to reality is actually fear. They're afraid that they cannot do what God has said, that it cannot be accomplished. The unity that Jesus prayed for, I guess the answer is no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that's not it. That's not the deal. The problem is fear. People are afraid that they can't accomplish what God wants, and that's just not true. So let's look at do not fear. In Deuteronomy, in the first chapter, I will remind you that Deuteronomy is Greek for the second giving of the law. <laughs> Which is to say, it's the law. It repeats a lot of what had been said in Exodus and Leviticus. That's true. But it's the law for the second generation from Egypt because the first generation are dying and falling in the wilderness. So Moses, when he speaks to them here in Deuteronomy 1, is speaking in retrospect, looking back at Numbers 14 and Numbers 15 and Numbers 16, at the place where the spies came back and brought an evil report, and the people were discouraged and decided to appoint a different leader and head back to Egypt. And they were defeated before their enemies, and God said, because they will not obey because they have refused and put me to the test these ten times. None of, none of these will enter the promised land. That was the point at which they were condemned to wander in the wilderness and to die there. The second generation, these are their children that Moses is speaking to, but he's looking back at that. When he says to them these things, Deuteronomy 1, verses 20 to 23, as well as 29 to 32. But first, 20 to 23, Moses tells them, I also said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So the first admonition here is go up, take possession, the Lord has said this. Do not fear or be dismayed. It's the first thing that out of the gate. As soon as they got to the, if you will, the edge of the promised land, the instruction through God's prophet Moses was, go up, take possession. Hasn't God said so? Then all of you came near me and said, let's send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. Well, this is the place where we learn that sending the spies was the people's idea. It wasn't Moses' idea. It wasn't God's idea. God said, go up and take it. They said, let's send some spies. What for? Well, uh, to tell us the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. What, is, what does that mean? It means, well, we just want to learn a strategic route for when we take the promised land. But see, in retrospect, we know that's not true. 
That's not what they were doing. That's just an excuse. They sent spies because they were afraid. They weren't trying to determine the most strategic entry point and the most strategic uh, targets to take first. It was an excuse. And when the spies came back, one from each tribe, they brought an evil report. And Moses said to them, Don't be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet, in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. So at that time, the people to whom this was said were the people who came out of Egypt. And Moses said, he fought for you. He will fight for you himself as he did in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness. We think of the triumphs they had over Moab and other things that happened along the way. God fights for them. Yet, in spite of this word, you didn't believe the Lord your God. They still refused to enter the promised land. They saw all of this, but they wouldn't do it. And it's what um, is recorded there in Numbers uh, 14. Jesus, uh, Jesus, God said, None of those who have seen my works that I did in Egypt and in this wilderness, and yet who have rebelled, will enter my rest. So that's the reference. That's the full picture. They got there. God said, Go in. They said, I have an idea. Let's send some spies. <laughs> right? They're afraid. And the spies come back and they have an evil report and the people rebel. Despite the fact that they saw all of this stuff that happened in Egypt, all of the, the uh, plagues that hit Egypt, they saw the crossing of the Red Sea. They were the people who did it. But that is just not enough. And they got to the promised land, they wouldn't go in there either. So this is the first thing, is in retrospect, it's clearly fear, isn't it? But it's also fear without reason. They have every indication from God that he will care for them and that he is more than capable of delivering them. So we... Fast forward a bit in Deuteronomy, same, the second generation in chapter 20, and it's verses 1 through 9. Here is where we talk about do not fear in a bit more detail, but understand what's happening. This now is a second generation. The first did not go to war against their enemies. They would not enter the promised land. It's the second generation now who are doing this. What does that mean? Well, it means this generation, the people who are actually going to enter the promised land and enter into battle, they are not the people who saw what happened in Egypt. They didn't see it with their own eyes. They do see chariots and horsemen in an established set of countries that are very powerful in Canaan. So that's frightening for them. And what little they may know about what happened in Egypt is either what the Bible says, as you and I have the Bible today, because they didn't see it themselves, and neither did we. There's, they didn't have anything else to go on than you and I have. They didn't have any more than you and I have. They had the words of Moses, or the testimony of their parents, perhaps. For those who had faithful parents, that might have been good, but for the rest of them, what excuse could they give for not entering the promised land? What excuse could they give for their children suffering, traveling through the wilderness? 
How could they encourage their children to go do the thing that they were afraid to do? To believe in the God that they didn't believe in. That's going to be hard, right? So he said, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Then, well, let me stop for a minute. It's God who fights for you to give you the victory. When you look at the odds, the odds are against you. The odds are insurmountable. In the same way that that generation didn't actually see Egypt or what happened there, they only had the word of God. We also didn't see Egypt or what happened there. We also didn't see Jesus or the resurrection. We only have the word of God. But we still have to go forward and we still should have no fear because God is still with us. God is still the one who fights the battles. And when you look out at the odds, if you will, in the world, the so-called reality, <laughs> the likelihood that people will obey the gospel or the likelihood that anybody will do the right thing or the likelihood that this will remain or grow or whatever, ah, those are always against you. Why would Satan let it look like you know, plausible. <laughs> that didn't make any sense. <laughs> the odds are always against you. You have to walk by faith, not by sight. This generation is required to walk by faith. They didn't see Egypt. They only read about it in God's word. The same way you and I do. The same way you and I do. They have to take the promised land the same way you and I have to conquer sin in our lives. The officers speak to the people in this way. Is there any man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? <laughs> Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Is there any man who's planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man enjoy its fruit. Is there any man who has betrothed the wife and not taken her? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. Why are they doing this? They're all things that compete with you know, your dedication to the mission at hand. They're all things that are used, if you will, as excuses. They're prioritized over working for God. And the officers then shall speak. After all of these people are out. Is there any man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. This is the critical thing. This is the critical thing. He said, do not fear or be dismayed. God will fight for you. If you've got excuses, you know, take your excuses and go. Now, everybody else, is there somebody here fearful and faint-hearted? If so, go home. So that you do not make the heart of your fellows, that is, the others around you, melt like your own. This is very important. Did you know the word for officers here? I didn't know this until I looked at it in the Septuagint. This, the word for officers in the Septuagint, they translate this scribes. The scribes, like in the New Testament, the Pharisees and their scribes, it's these officers. <laughs> That's interesting. They're supposed to be teaching from the word. That's the point. But they speak. Anybody fearful and faint-hearted, go home. Don't make everybody else's heart melt. What does it mean? Well, in the spirit today, it, you know, 
It means if you will not rep reprove and rebuke and exhort with great persistence, then you should not be teaching. That's what that means. Do not teach your doubts about God's word, your doubts about our ability to do it or to understand it. You will melt the hearts of the brethren, and that is certainly what has happened in the open fellowship movement. People have been uh, discouraged it, to the point of believing. We can't understand it. We'll never understand it. There won't be unity. We just have to go along to get along. That's all we can do. And God gets cut out of that equation, see? God is the one who doesn't get his portion. Everybody here might be happy because they got big, you know, whatever. They got friends, they get along, they got big numbers, they got stuff for the kids to do, all that kind of stuff. But God is the one who's getting shortchanged by that because he said, go, and you're not going. And when the officers are done speaking, the commanders shall be appointed at the head of the people. Only after you have winnowed out all the excuses and all the cowardly. Faint-hearted is cowardly. That is when you can appoint commanders. That's when you have leaders. Just to back up what we're saying, if, if you are not willing to stand for that faith, if you are not willing to enter the promised land in full faith that God will fight for you, and even though the odds are against you, you can overcome with him, then you shouldn't be a leader. Now in Luke 14, we should look at this as well, because it's the same thing. Jesus poses a parable in Luke 14, verses 16 through 24, and we will look at it, because it's what we just read. <laughs> it's fascinating, actually. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. At the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, everything is now ready. His servant, one servant, he makes the banquet, he invites many, and the time has come. So he sends a servant who says, Come, everything is now ready. What do you think that is? <laughs> is it not God the Father? who has prepared all things and sent us his son, who calls us to come because of the fullness of the times. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I bought a field, I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, I must examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. See, these are the excuses that we just read in Deuteronomy 20 why you need to go home. Have you got property? Get out of here. You got, you know, <laughs> some animal or some vineyard, you know, get out of here. You, you uh, got a wife at home that, you know, you're worried about that. Get, get out of here. But right? that's, that's what's happening. They're all saying, yeah, I'm not, I'm not willing to go to battle. It's also when, you know, here in Luke 14, he says, they all alike began to make excuses. This is what's framing our understanding of uh, Deuteronomy 1, where they said, you know, I've got an idea. Why don't we send some spies first? That's an excuse. <laughs> They've been invited. Come, everything is now ready. Listen, go, take possession. <clears throat> but no, uh, you know, there's a lot of things happen. I'm very busy. Uh huh. So the servant came back and reported these things to the master who became angry. The master of the house became angry. Now, if you're thinking this is a simple dinner and people are busy and it's just a social engagement, and the stakes are not high, you know, you're missing the point. The point is that God expects us to do what he called us to do. He made everything ready and we are supposed to obey him. When we do not, it garners his ire. He said to the servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. 
But he started with those who were, quote unquote, presentable, who should have been, you know, the better groomed, the ones who were ready, which is to say the house of Israel. But now he's calling everybody else who is far off, those who are taken out of Israel to foreign countries, which we see come back in, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, right? Then the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there's room. The master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges. Compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. That's us, the Gentiles. I tell you, none of those men who were invited will taste my banquet. Right? None of those men who saw my works in Egypt and in this wilderness and yet have rebelled will enter my rest. That's what this is. It's a very clear retelling. But in this case, we're talking about an invitation to a banquet, as in God has prepared for us a spiritual feast and we are called to it in Christ Jesus to obey him. But refusal to obey him, well, is the same as refusal to enter the promised land. Obeying him is how you enter the promised land. That's how you get forgiveness. That's how you get God on your side to fight battles for you. That is how you have a hope of heaven when life is done. And you know, the truth is that fear is condemned. Cowardice is condemned. I think this is an important point. It's a very sad thing. I think this might be one of the saddest things in, you know, in existence. The person who is so afraid of God and so afraid of consequences that he doesn't do anything. He doesn't obey. And that person gets called into question for not having obeyed him. To, to, you know, to live a whole life of fear only to realize what you were afraid of. That, to me, is maybe the saddest thing in the universe. But the Lord said it's a matter of guilt. Notice Matthew 8, 24 to 26. There arose a great storm on the sea, so the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Well, did they have reason to think that they were in trouble? <laughs> They're on a small craft. There's a great storm. The waves are breaking over and filling the boat. Typically, that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> but these have already obeyed the Lord. They're his disciples, and he's with them in the boat. Why would they think that the Son of God will die by shipwreck? That doesn't make any sense. They should have known that they weren't going to die. The Lord was with them. Why are you afraid, you of little faith? And you would say, well, it looks like there's good reason to be afraid. Well, yeah, it kind of looks that way. But in fact, when the Lord is with you, remember the psalm? Is it 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Right? That's something that people miss in Psalm 23 very often. Uh, it's not a promise that you won't walk through the valley. Uh, I think that it's a promise that you will, but that he will go with you. <laughs> and he will help you. Why are you afraid? And he said they have little faith. They're not trusting him when they should trust him. And that's the thing. It takes trust because the odds are against it. You have to trust him because it doesn't seem like you're going to survive in this boat or it doesn't seem like you're going to succeed 
overtaking Canaan? Or does it seem like resurrection from the dead is possible? Go down the line. Yes, it takes faith. It takes trust. And in Revelation 21, Jesus said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That means the A and the Z. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He will be my son. Have you noticed before This sounds very much like the promises of the land flowing with milk and honey. It sounds like the inheritance that he promised to Abraham and his children, doesn't it? It also, uh, well, for now, this is what we're talking about. It also shows that spring of the water of life, water from the rock, as God cared for them in the wilderness, all the things he promised them. I am the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. But that's a direct reference to conquering the promised land and having it as your inheritance. Only it's a spiritual one here. I will be his God. He will be my son. It is also a direct reference to what happened to those who died in the wilderness. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, fornicators, uh, drug dealers, or sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You can see the connection a lake burning with fire and sulfur where Korah and his ilk were taken down alive. It starts with the cowardly and the faithless. So, yes, God condemns cowardice. This is the same fearful or faithlessness that was called out in Deuteronomy 20. Is anybody here faint-hearted? He should go home so he does not discourage the hearts, make the other hearts melt. That's this word cowardly in the Septuagint. And it really is what it's talking about. It's one thing to be afraid, and and there's good reason to be afraid of God. Uh, And for that matter, it's, it's, it's a thing to be afraid of what lies in front of you, the task that is in front of you. Uh, Our Lord certainly was afraid in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in agony. It is not a sin to be scared. It is a sin to let fear dictate that you don't obey God, that you don't do what God said. Now, people think that uh, (laughs) courage is not being afraid. No, courage is being afraid, but doing it anyway. That's how it really is. Yeah, you're afraid. Why wouldn't you be afraid? But you do it anyway, because you trust God that he will deliver you. Let's put some closing thoughts on this. Remember what he told them? The Lord himself will fight the battle. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses says, I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to come out, or to go out and come in. That's a a, a figure of speech for war. He can't go to battle. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will will cross before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you will dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. Moses says, I am old. I'm not going to be allowed to cross the Jordan. It's going to be Joshua. But notice, the Lord your God himself goes over before you, not me. And Joshua will be at your head. 
as the Lord has spoken. Which is Jesus, of course. Joshua is the Hebrew name. That Hebrew name, Joshua, in the Greek New Testament is Jesus. His name is Joshua. And in the sixth verse, he said, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. It is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. I think that is the most important verse. He will not leave you or forsake you. It's very sad um, that Moses couldn't enter the promised land after all that he did. Is he saying to them, he won't leave you like I will? I think he is. I'm going to die, but God doesn't die. That's what he's saying. God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. That's true. And in John 14, Jesus said, These things I've spoken to you while still with you. In verse 25, before his crucifixion, he speaks to the disciples one last time. I've spoken these things while still with you. 25 down to 27 of John 14. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is the same. It's what Moses said. Even if my physical presence ends, the word of God does not end. Jesus may leave the earth and they won't know him in the flesh any longer, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, but, or uh, 5. But they will uh, nonetheless have the Holy Spirit guide them into everything, not just what they heard while they were with him, but everything that needs to be recorded. And this is the peace that he leaves with us. Not as the world gives, do I give. As in, others may forsake you, I will not. The world may give and take back, I won't. His word is secure. The peace that is available to us, the peace with God that we can have by obedience to his word, that is secure, that nobody can take that. That will not stop. God will always be here. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It's what we read. Don't be afraid. God goes with you. God protects you. God, God fights the battle for you. And it's true. We today overcome sin not by our own power, but by the power of God's word that enables us, that educates us, that tells us what he wants and how to please him in life. So do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. It can be done. You can please God if that is your desire. Today, are you a child of God? Are you a Christian? You need to be a Christian if you would please God. And your life, the things in your life, are the promised land that needs to be conquered. And while it may seem, oh, I can't do it, um, you know, I don't have the power, God is your power. God helps you overcome. So today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian, a child of God. There's no reason to fear the Lord if you will do what is pleasing to him. And he is great, greatly merciful. Time and again, you can come to him and he will help you. He loves us. He loves his people. He's very forgiving. He will lift us up. And our path is always to lead upward. So today, if you're not a Christian, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. Put him on in baptism that you might be a child of God, giving your life to him from now on. That's a repentance, a change of heart, a change of person. You're a new person in Christ. Having done these things, you are a Christian. And if, as a Christian, you haven't lived right, repent. Come back to the Lord and go to the battle. Live for him and overcome by faith. 
If we can help you with our prayers, we're glad to do it. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song.